Well, hello there. Welcome to Alyssa Jean's Reviews. My name is Alyssa, and this is my review for Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 7, But Connect. I learned from Will Wheaton on the Ready Room that the ellipses means you pause at the beginning. But Connect. Honestly, I think that title is pretty uh, pretentious, <laughs> but whatever. Um, this is the mid-season uh, finale of Discovery, which is taking a little break and coming back from February 10th. And I have some things to say about that, which I'll get into in just a second. But before we go any further, a spoiler <coughs> warning! <coughs> if you have not seen up through Season 4, Episode 7 of Discovery, then it was rather foolish of you to uh, click on this video, quite frankly. <laughs> I'm kidding. Anyways... Getting ahead and do a full spoilers. Actually, first, I do want to just talk about this mid-season finale thing. What the hell? When did that happen? Like, they just announced it last week. Was this something that was always planned? Or was this maybe, is this a thing to maybe allow the international Paramount Plus kind of catch up a little bit? Uh, I don't know. What, what is this? Uh, I, I was a little frustrated by that because I feel like Discovery has got a lot of momentum going. And for them to just kind of stop right here, like, come on. And it's going to be replaced, apparently, next week. They're bringing back uh, a Prodigy, which I thought wasn't coming back till February. But now Prodigy's coming back next week, and Discovery's taking a break until February. And um, honestly, it's gonna, that's going to be a rough transition for me, going from the high quality that Discovery's been giving us this season to a kid show. And I saw the clip on the, the Ready Room. They showed a clip from... Uh, the next Prodigy episode, and it still looks like a silly kid show to me, and I'm just not interested, but I'm going to watch it anyway because it has the word Star Trek in it. Um, <laughs> so that's going to be rough for me, like I, I'm going from what has been a pretty quality show this season to one that I don't think is very quality, at least not for adults. Um, anyways, my complaints aside, let's get into this episode. So uh, this episode was basically two different groups of people sitting around or standing around, as the case may be, and having deep uh, philosophical debates and or discussions on two different, very, I would say, Star Trekian issues. Uh, so just two different groups of people kind of standing or sitting around talking, and I freaking loved it! This is the best episode of the season! Easily. Um, and I'm gonna have to say it's definitely one of the best episodes of the series. I don't think... The Discovery really hasn't had any truly great episodes. Uh, but there's definitely episodes in the past that I really love. I, I'm gonna have to put this up there with them. Um, <laughs> I freaking love this episode. Um... As I said, it does address two very Star Trekian uh, issues, um, but they do it in a much more nuanced way than has been done before. In both cases, I have a clear side that I that I'm on, but I also really empathize with the other point of view as well. Whereas in the past, it's been very much more black and white. Um, you have, uh, you know, Bruce Maddox saying that Data is a toaster and we need to take him away. Well, I know Bruce Maddox didn't have the toaster line, but I couldn't think of any of his specific lines. But you know what I mean? Like, he's very clearly adversarial and we're very clearly on the side of our Starfleet officers and is very black and white, whereas this was much more nuanced. Now, as I said, I still take a side on each of these debates, but I emphasize a lot with the other side and really see where they are coming from. And I thought that was fantastic. So absolutely loved this episode. Now let me get into more of the specifics. And I'll kind of start with that A plot. Um, I call it the A plot because Burnham is in it. <laughs> um, with the gathering of all the Federation and non-Federation planets to discuss what to do. Okay, so before I get into the nitty-gritty of this discussion and debate and the results of it, I kind of want to start with some of the more surface-level things, some of the aesthetics, um, which I thought were very cool. Uh, I loved 
that Earth was involved. I've kind of been wondering when we would see, uh, you know, a representative of Earth again. And of course, they bring back the character that we met in season three, which made a lot of sense. She informs them that, you know, they're now together with Titan, which was kind of the uh, the subject matter of that episode that they were in in season three. Um, which was very interesting. So I loved seeing them back. And I also appreciated that she had that kind of more aggressive militaristic mindset, which is consistent with the way that Earth was presented. And I also really appreciated that Relic was like, yeah, I, I would really love to get Earth back <laughs> into the Federation again. One of the founding members, that would be a big deal. Uh, and I love how she told the little... A uh, side story about how it's her mom's ancestral home, telling us a little bit more about her uh, her heritage. Uh, it has been stated, I think, off screen by some of the producers or whoever that she was uh, or she is Bajoran, Cardassian, and human. And so uh, her mom, I guess, is more on the human side, but had never been to Earth, so it was good to hear. See, that is the proper way to introduce backstory instead of just having uh, one of the crew members just say, well, now I was a kid, like they did the last two episodes. This actually worked, and I really appreciated that, and it makes sense that she would want Earth back in the Federation. Um, and we'll see if that happens by the end of the season. Uh, so I really appreciated that. Um, and overall, I love what they did uh, with what they had to work with in COVID times. So as it's pointed out in the ready room when they do the behind the scenes thing, which I would have already known anyways, this was filmed during COVID. So you couldn't really have a whole ton of people together. So I think given those circumstances, they did the best they could in having all um, all those people standing around, but then showing that the, the camera pans down and it shows that, that that thing goes way, way, way down. And there's like, it's like this, you know, infinite pit that <laughs> goes way down of all these people standing around to show that there really is a lot of people there uh, without having to crowd people in during COVID times. Now, there's not really an end-universe explanation for why everyone is standing six feet apart, but, you know, what are you going to do? I thought that uh, they did the absolute best with what they had, uh, and I thought it was very cool seeing all these different races, some that we know, some that we don't know, and I'm just going to say that Orion woman looks fantastic. Like, she's gorgeous. She's gorgeous. Oh, I'm so jealous of her hair. <laughs> her hair is amazing. If I uh, were ever to cosplay, I don't really cosplay, uh, but I would be that specific Orion woman, but except I'd never get my hair like that. She, she, she is fabulous. Anyways, <laughs> uh, I, I liked the, the look of, of it overall. My complaint, one complaint, is that Relic says that we have gathered representatives from all four quadrants of the galaxy, um, which I can buy. I mean... They didn't have warp travel for a while, but and they only had the one spore drive so far. But I could buy that they would have a way to communicate with other parts of the quadrant. And maybe in the past they were able to travel to them before the burn and all that. Um, and now they've reestablished communication with them because they have more advanced communication technology. That's totally fine. But uh, where my beef is, is where the fuck are the Kazons or the Herogen? Or I want to see, it, if you're going to say that there's representatives of all four quadrants, I want to see some goddamn Delta Quadrant aliens there. And Gamma Quadrant. Now, would it have been, you know, uh, would it, maybe it would be, but would it have been a lot to have to have a founder there? I mean, you know, it was like 900 years ago that Odo went into the little pool and uh you know uh taught everybody how to be you know loving and peaceful and accepting of other species and that was 900 years so i think it is reasonable that the founders would have evolved into a more accepting more benevolent race by now um or maybe like a more you know evolved uh, version of the vorta i don't know that jim hadar makes a lot of sense at this point but you know would that have been a lot to ask? I mean, it might have been weird because then there's like, oh, how are they there? And then there's this unspoken backstory that they can't really get to because it would be too much of a distraction. I get it. But don't tell me that you're getting aliens from all four quadrants and not have any Delta Quadrant and Gamma Quadrant aliens there. That oh, Please don't tease me like that. Don't tease me like that. Anyways, <laughs> a... A very minor complaint. Now let me get into the substance of this scene. So uh, getting into uh, the heart of uh, the matter, uh, I find this to be a very tricky debate, and specifically a Star Trek Voyager 
Janeway versus Chakotay <laughs> debate where it's uh, like how far do we need to go to stick to our principles, to stick to who we are, or is this just extenuating circumstances where we need to maybe think a little bit outside of the box and maybe we don't have the luxury of sticking completely to our principles. The very classic Chakotay versus Janeway debate before those characters just got thrown and flushed down the toilet in favor of the Doctor and the Seven of Nine show <laughs> in the later seasons. I just watched Rob Voyager, so, you know... There's that. And it's interesting that they did do another name drop of the current Voyager. I think they're laying it a little on thick, uh, laying it on a little thick with the Voyager reference in every single episode. <laughs> now I just got to see the goddamn ship now and see the people on it. We've seen the ship, but I want to see the crew because you keep mentioning it. Um, so anyways, it's, it's uh, appropriate that they've mentioned Voyager, and this is a very uh, specifically Voyager theme, um, but I think done... Uh, even better than it was done on Voyager, as we have here um, two lovers who, taking the lead on the opposing viewpoints, and um, it was very real and genuine. It was not something that was forced. It wasn't like the writers were like, "Oh well, let's make Book say this and Burnham say that," just because it would be it would be interesting to have lovers quarreling. Um, no, it was very, very real and genuine that they each would have that uh, specific position um now of course it starts off just being more of a generalized you know um do we try to approach them with peace or do we go in with guns blazing um and then a new wrinkle is introduced when tarka comes up uh, and i love this character by the way uh, and he comes up and introduces his method of um destroying the dma that he has come up with and um Burnham made some good points that, but we've got to consider all of the potential consequences for that um, because that could, for all we know, um, cause damage to uh, whoever created this and that might piss them off. <laughs> they may want to, maybe their intentions weren't originally um, hostile, but now they would be because we caused this. Uh, and so we just got to really take our time to think about all of the different um you know, possible outcomes. Um, and then we get a little bit of Tarka's motivation uh, where he talks about this story where he and this other dude, at first I was thinking it was that dude in the, the wheelchair from last year, <laughs> last year, but that actor, well, unfortunately, is not um, healthy enough to be able to, to film any more scenes. So probably not him, but um, that they um, had agreed to go and meet in this parallel universe. And... Um, I love how books like the Mary Universe is like, no, it's not like the Mary Universe is the only universe. Because Star Trek really does treat it like uh, the Mary Universe is the only universe except for um, in the episode Parallels in the Next Generation. So I love that he pointed that out. Um, I want to know more. I hope this is not all they're going to touch on on this. Like, why does he want to go to a parallel universe specifically? What is there for him? Uh, I need more. Uh, so hopefully we're getting that. Um also, the way that he talked about this friend of his, it almost seemed like there was in your windows that they were in a romantic relationship, which would be weird for him to just say friend when this show has an openly gay couple. We have a trans and non-binary character. Uh, it, if that's the case, he should just say my lover because that's how we are. That's how we roll on Discovery. <laughs> like, um, So um, it would be weird if he just said it was a friend and it was more than the friend, um, but uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess we'll, we'll see. I do want to see more of that. Um, but anyways, um, so we get a little bit of Tarka's motivation here. Um, and then Book is completely on Team Tarka. Here's where it gets really good. This is what I really loved about this episode is that Book gives a speech. And I am definitely... 100% on Team Burnham, Team Janeway. <laughs> She's taking the, the Janeway point of view that we must stick to our principles at all costs. Uh, doesn't matter. We can always find a way to stick to our principles. And Janeway proved that that could be accomplished. So I'm on Team Burnham here, but Book gives this speech that almost had me convinced. Like, it was a very convincing speech. Tarka starts clapping and, and gets all these other people to clap. And then when everybody's clapping, I was like, oh, he wins. Like, there's, uh, Burnham's not going to be able to top that. 
Um, it was a very convincing speech. And I think the thing that makes it most convincing to me is that it wasn't a, a revenge thing for him. It wasn't like his, he's seeking his white whale and he wants to get revenge. It was more coming from a place that I'm dealing with my grief by helping other people from never having to go through what I went through. Like, I really desperately want to prevent other planets or other people from other planets having to suffer the way that I have. I don't want <clears throat> any other you know, race of people to be extinct. I want to prevent that from happening. So it was more, uh, like, this is how he's processing his grief, is that he really wants to prevent any further damage. Not so much that, oh, I got to go get my revenge on my white whale. Kirk! Kirk! You know, it's nothing like that, which would have been, you know, kind of cliche and cartoonish, where this is much more interesting and complicated and nuanced and that's why i think the argument was really convincing his his speech was a lot more convincing than i thought it was going to be um and he was very elegant in the way he, that he spoke um so i absolutely loved that now burnham comes back um with uh, an elegant speech of her own uh, talking about uh, how we really need to stick to our principles and um, I think she could have maybe emphasized a little bit more what she had said earlier about uh, examining the consequences. Um, it was more about, you know, this is who we are and all that, but I still really liked it. I don't know, actually, that I loved the choice of intersplicing it with Stamets' speech. I think I would have preferred them to be separate because uh, Book got to have his say without being interrupted <laughs> by anyone else talking. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I would have liked to just have Burnham have her, her say just clearly, just get it all out there. Um, I understand what they were doing there, you know, showing kind of the parallels from, uh, you know, what Burnham was saying, what Stamens was saying. I get it, but I, you know, I kind of would have preferred it if it was just a straight up Burnham speech. But it's, that's not that big of a deal. Um, uh, overall, I uh, really loved it. And I love that she did, she was able to convince everybody, even the Ferengi. The Ferengi voted for her. Did you see that? <laughs> so, um, yeah. And then, of course, this leads to um, Tarka with the spore drive that has been mentioned before. We knew he was working on one. Um, he comes and says, oh, we're going to integrate this into your system. And um, really sad he leaves uh, <laughs> Crotch behind, which he should. I think he goddamn should. He takes that cat onto way too many dangerous missions. So it was good that he left it behind, but at the same time, uh, it was kind of sad for Burnham to find uh, Crouch, what, oh, Crouch, <laughs> Crouch, what's this, Crouch, Crouch, whatever, the cat's name, the cat, <laughs> um, and realize that what uh, Book is about to do, and I thought that was a really great way to uh, end this episode and leave us on a little bit of a cliffhanger of what's going to happen with um, Tarka and Book and now Burnham being put in a position of having to stop her lover and uh, I find that all very very interesting I still wish there wasn't a goddamn break and I had not to wait till February but uh, I'm very excited to see where they pick up with this storyline okay now let's move on over to the other storyline which is also people sitting around having a philosophical debate which I also really loved uh, and this, of course, has to do with Zora. And first of all, I am very pleased that they have decided to bring Zora into the forefront these last two episodes. I was a little concerned that she was just going to be kind of brushed aside and forgotten. She wasn't really addressed all of that much at all through the uh, first, uh, what, five episodes. Uh, so I'm glad that they're like, hey, yeah, we've got this uh, really interesting uh, AI <laughs> computer running the ship not running the ship but as part of the ship um so let's explore that a lot more especially with uh, the introduction to her between way back before season two in the calypso short so i don't know if we're ever really going to connect the dots to that short but we still need to, to uh see uh hey zora's there <laughs> and we still need that address so i'm very very happy with the last two episodes in that regard um and this wasn't a, a very nuanced and interesting debate. And as I uh, said on the top of this video, there's no, you know, Lieutenant Commander Maddox here saying that Zora is a toaster and we just need to box her up. Um, it's much more nuanced than that. In fact, her the, the only 
um, you know, threat to her was to remove her from Discovery. They weren't going to kill her. Um, and she, but she didn't want that because Discovery was who she is. She says that I don't want to lose my form any any more than any of you would want to give up your form, um, which was a very interesting case to make. Then of course it turns out those weren't actually the stakes at all, which I'll get to later. Uh, but um, so that's interesting. And also uh, Stamets taking the counter uh, viewpoint. I really emphasize empathize with Stamets. Um, you know, he's still obviously um, traumatized by control. Uh, now, Adira and uh, Gray did not experience control, which Stamets points out. With all due respect, you don't, you didn't go through control. Um, Dr. Colber, did he, was, was that when he, wasn't he dead though? I don't think Colber really went through it either, because didn't he like die <laughs> and then he came back to life in the, in the third season? So I don't know if Colber really experienced the trauma of um, control either. I, I, uh, Saru did, but you know Saru is is just going to be a lot more cool headed and calm than than Stamets. So, I, so um, but there was just a lot of great points uh, brought up on both sides of this issue, and I can really feel for Stamets because honestly, even though I've seen the Calypso short, and I know that in the future of this. Uh, Zora is still going to be this kind, sweet computer. I still have it in the back of my head that um, she could turn evil and be an evil super genius computer. And um, the, her refusing this order uh, it could be the first step in her becoming evil because I've watched a lot of Star Trek. <laughs> uh, Lauren Dex actually pointed out in, a, in an episode this year with a, the brilliant Jeffrey Combs playing an evil supercomputer uh, that uh, this has been a trope that has been done a thousand times in Star Trek because at the end of that episode you see the Jeffrey Combs uh, computer being placed in this little box uh, with all of these other supercomputers and as it pans out you see that there's this vast amount of supercomputers that are kept in this storage area and they're all like no I'm the evil one no I will take over the world no you are full I will take over the world and it was such a brilliant representation of how many goddamn <laughs> supercomputers, evil supercomputers, there have been in Star Trek. But it's not only Star Trek, it's just a sci-fi trope in general. Like, it's been all over sci-fi. So for me, just having seen that trope done so many times, it is very easy for me to just kind of think, yeah, Zora's going to be evil. Even though I've seen her future and she's not evil, it still feels like she could just turn evil because that is such a common trope. And I love love that they're subverting that trope but i also really emphasize empathize with stamets's viewpoint even if i do ultimately come down on the other side that uh that they should um give zora a chance and i actually thought of stamets's uh solution before he did i was like why well, don't they just make her a member of the crew so she has to follow orders i would solve that problem right there <laughs> but uh first they do have the great speech where stamets uh, elicits trust. She's like, I, I want to trust you. But it has to go two ways. You got to trust us. Love that. That was brilliant. I loved it. Um, and um, so it was a great resolution to uh, that problem. And then uh, Stamets' solution, of course, is that she just kind of becomes a member of the crew. Now, I have questions. Does she need, does Zora need to go to Starfleet Academy? Um, does she, <laughs> uh, is she going to get a rank? Is she going to have to start off as an ensign? Seems That seems beneath her. Like, uh, she's running the whole ship. I think she should be higher than an ensign. Is she a lieutenant? I think she'll at least be a lieutenant commander. But <laughs> lieutenant commander is Zora. <laughs> I don't know. How's that going to work? I have questions. I have questions about that. But I love that that was the solution. As I said, I thought of it before Zamich did. Um, and... Um, I also uh, love the conclusion that she is not an AI, technically. She's a new life form and therefore does not fall under the Starfleet regulations. They cannot have a sentient computer as, uh, you know, a Starship computer. Now, I assume this is more of a 32nd century rule. This is not a rule I've ever heard of, but I don't think it would have been relevant in the previous incarnations of Trek. Uh, so the, but that makes a lot of sense that it would be a 32nd century rule. 
Um, so I, I love that that was the conclusion that they came to, that she's not an uh, sentient AI, she's a new life form, which was fantastic. Okay, now though, I do need to address my biggest complaint of this episode. Uh, the one thing that really bothered me about this episode, it was so close to being a perfect episode. It was so close. And then at the very end, they had to go and do something that really bugs me. And uh, that is Dr. Kovic's line at the end, uh, where he says, oh yeah, I was never actually going to uh, remove uh, uh, Zora. I was just going to remove you, talking to Stamets. So first of all, he said he was going well, to recommend that Stamets be removed. First of all, uh, he can recommend whatever he wants. No admiral in their right mind would take the only Starfleet officer capable of operating the only spore drive off of that ship. Why? That makes no sense. That leaves Book, who's not a Starfleet officer. This is even before, you know, we know anything about him going rogue or anything like that. He's not a commissioned Starfleet officer. So there is 0% chance they would remove the only Starfleet officer who can operate the only spore drive from that ship. That makes zero sense. Admiral Vance's response would be, I don't care what problem he has with the AI. He needs to get the fuck over it and fucking run the spore drive like he's supposed to. I mean, he wouldn't use the F words, but that's basically what his position would be in I would 1,000% agree with that because that makes sense. It makes zero sense for Kovic to suggest that Stamets would ever be removed from Discovery. And also, uh, the thing that really bugs me about this is when he says, oh, I was never going to actually uh, remove Zora, he is saying, oh, there actually weren't any stakes to this discussion after all. The stakes were fake. That is what really pisses me off. So in other words, Dr. Kovic was saying, it's only a game. <laughs> uh, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, please refer to uh, my video for the 10 least favorite Deep Space Nine episodes, and specifically the episode Move Along Home. I use the phrase, it's only a game, as a, as a statement on episodes that have no stakes to them. Um, although this one isn't nearly as bad as that one, as that one was a bad episode before it was revealed that there is no stakes and never had been any stakes. This one doesn't bother me as much as that and certainly does not ruin the entire episode, as you know from the fact that I still say that I love this episode. However, it makes it so that I cannot in good conscience give this episode a 10, and I may have done so before <laughs> that line that just really bugs the crap out of me uh so not quite a perfect episode now that actually let's let's go ahead and transition into the rating now i think i've said all i need to say about this episode let's jump over to the rating what am i going to give it clearly not a 10 i think you can probably guess <laughs> uh from the way i've been talking about this episode if it's not a 10 then of course it is a nine uh still uh the best episode of the season um the nuanced debate uh, was riveting. If you can have just people standing around, sitting around talking uh, in two different storylines and have me captivated for the entire episode, that is that is quality. That is good stuff. This is what Star Trek is all about for me, or one of the things Star Trek is all about for me. Uh, there are different aspects of Star Trek that I love, uh, and this really hit on one of them. So absolutely love this episode. A 9 out of 10. Uh, I'm sorry that I have to wait until February to see where this leads, uh, but I'm very pleased with the season of Discovery so far. Anyways, that does it for my review of Star Trek Discovery Season 4, Episode 7. Uh, I am not going to be covering Prodigy as I wasn't before, so uh, I will be back uh, with my weekly Discovery coverage in February when it returns. But in the meantime, I have all kinds of other fun stuff coming up in January, including my 10 least favorite and 10 favorite uh, Voyager episodes will be released in January, uh, among other things. So subscribe if you have not already. Hit the like button, and I will see you soon. Goodbye.